Good afternoon and welcome back to another episode of The Longing. Today we are going to be continuing to read The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett, I believe. I'm going to double check that before I continue actually because I might be slightly wrong. Nope, Francis Hodgson Burnett. So let's get going. I have no friends at all, said Mary. I never had. My ayah didn't like me, and I never played with anyone. It is a Yorkshire habit to say what you think with blunt frankness, and old Ben Weatherstaff was a Yorkshire moor man. Tha me a good, good bit alike, he said. We was wove out of the same cloth. We're neither of us good looking, and we're both of us as sour as we look. We've got the same nasty tempers, both of us, I'll warrant. This was plain speaking and Mary Lennox had never heard the truth about herself in her life. Native servants always salamed and submitted to you, whatever you did. She had never thought much about her looks, but she wondered if she was as unattractive as Ben Weatherstaff, and she also wondered if she looked as sour as he had looked before the robin came. She actually began to wonder also if she was nasty-tempered. She felt uncomfortable. Suddenly a clear, rippling little sound broke out near her, and she turned round, she was standing a few feet from a young apple tree, and the robin had flown onto one of its branches and had burst out into a scrap of a song. Ben Weatherstaff laughed outright. What did he do that for? asked Mary. He's made up his mind to make friends with thee, replied Ben. Dang me if he hasn't took a fancy to thee. To me, said Mary, and she moved towards the little tree softly and looked up. Would you make friends with me, she said to the robin, just as if she was speaking to a person. Would you? And she did not say it either in her hard little voice, or in her imperious Indian voice, but in a tone so soft and eager and coaxing, that Ben Weatherstaff was as surprised as she had been when she heard him whistle. Why, he cried out, they said that as nice as, nice and human as if there was a real child instead of a sharp old woman. That said it almost like Dickon talks to his wild things on more. Do you know Dickon? Mary asked, turning round rather in a hurry. Everybody knows him. Dickon's wandering ab about everywhere. Very Blackberries and other bells know him. I warrant the foxes shows him where their cubs lies, and the skylarks doesn't hide their nests from him. Mary would have liked to ask some more questions. She was almost as curious about Dickon as, as she was about the deserted garden. But just that moment the robin, who had ended his song, gave a little shake of his wings, spread them, and flew away. He had made his visit and had other things to do. He has flown over the wall, Mary cried out, watching him. He has flown into the orchard. He has flown across the other wall, into the garden where, the, where there is no door. He lives there, said old Ben. He came out uh, of the egg there. If he's caught and he's making up to some young madam off of a robin that lives among the old rose trees there. Rose trees, said Mary. Are there rose trees? Ben Weatherstaff took up his spade again and began to dig. There was ten years ago, he mumbled. I should like to see them, said Mary. Where is the green door? There must be a door somewhere. Ben drove his spade deep and looked as uncompanionable companionable, as he had looked when she first saw him. There was ten year ago, but there isn't now, he added. No door, cried Mary. There must be. None as anyone can find, and none as is anyone's business. Don't you be a meddlesome wench and poke your nose where it, it's no cause to go. Here, I must go on with me work. Get you gone and play with you. I've no more time. And he actually stopped digging, threw his spade over his shoulder and walked off, without even glancing at her or saying goodbye. Chapter 5. The Cry in the Corridor At first, each day which passed by for Mary Lennox was exactly like the others. Every morning she awoke in her tapestry room and found Martha kneeling upon the hearth, building her fire. 
Every morning she ate her breakfast in the nursery, which had nothing amusing in it. And after each breakfast she gazed out of the window across to the huge moor which seemed to spread out on all sides and climb up to the sky. And after she had stared for a while she realised that if she did not go out she would have to stay in and do nothing. And so she went out. She did not know that this was the best thing she could have done, and she did not know that when she began to walk quickly or even run along the paths and down the avenue. She was stirring her slow blood and making herself stronger by fighting with the wind which swept down from the moor. She ran only to make herself warm, and she hated the wind which rushed at her face and roared and held her back, as if it were some giant she could not see. But the, but, uh, but the big breaths of rough, fresh air blown over the heather filled her lungs with something which was good for her whole thin body, and whipped some red colour into her cheeks and brightened her dull eyes when she did not know anything about it. But after a few days spent almost entirely out of doors, she wakened one morning, knowing what it was to be hungry. And when she sat down to her breakfast, she did not glance disdainfully at her porridge and push it away, but took up her spoon and began to eat it and went on eating it until her bowl was empty. I got on well enough with that this morning, didn't I? said Martha. It tastes nice today, said Mary, feeling a little surprised herself. It's the air on the moor that's given thee stomach for the victuals, answered Martha. It's lucky for thee that thou's got victuals as well as appetite. It's been twelve in our cottage, as had stomach and nothing to put in it. You go and play in you out of doors every day, and you'll get some flesh on your bones, and you won't be so yellow. I don't play, said Mary. I have nothing to play with. Nothing to play with, exclaimed Martha. Our children plays with sticks and stones. They just runs about and shouts and looks at things. Mary did not shout, but she looked at things. There was nothing else to do. She walked round and round the gardens and wandered about the paths in the park. Sometimes she looked for Ben Weatherstaff, but though several times she saw him at work, he was too busy to look at her or was too surly. Once when she was walking towards him, he picked up his spade and turned away as if, as if he did it on purpose. One place she went to oftener than to any other. It was the long walk outside the gardens with the walls round them. There were bare flower beds on either side of it, and against the walls ivy grew thickly. There was one part of the wall where the creeping dark green leaves were more bushy than elsewhere. It seemed as if, for a long time, that part had been neglected. The rest of it had been clipped and made to look neat, but at this lower end of the walk it had not been trimmed at all. A few days after she had talked to Ben Weatherstaff, Mary stopped to notice this, and wondered why it was so. She had just paused and was looking up at a long spray of ivy swinging in the wind when she saw a gleam of scarlet and heard a brilliant chirp, and there, on the top of the wall, forward perched Ben Weatherstaff's robin redbreast, tilting forward to look at her with his small head on one side. Oh, she cried out, is it you? Is it you? And it did not seem at all queer to her that she spoke to him as if she was sure that he would understand and answer her. He did answer. He twittered and chirped and hopped along the wall as if he were telling her all sorts of things. It seemed to Mistress Mary as if she understood him, too, though he was not speaking in words. It was as if he said, Good morning. Isn't the wind nice? Isn't the sun nice? Isn't everything nice? Let us both chirp and hop and twitter. Come on, come on. Mary begin, began to laugh, and as he hopped and took little flights along the wall, she ran after him. Poor little thin, sallow, ugly Mary. She actually looked almost pretty for a moment. I like you, I like you, she cried out, pattering down the walk, and she chirped and tried to whistle, which last she did not know how to do in the least but the robin seemed to be quite satisfied, and chirped and whistled back at her. At last he spread his wings and made a darting flight to the top of a tree, where he perched and sang loudly. That reminded Mary of the first time she had seen him. He had been swinging on a treetop, then, uh, then, and she had been standing in the orchard. Now she was on the other side of the orchard and standing in the path outside a wall, much lower down, and there was the same tree inside. 
And with that, we come to the end of the episode. So I'll say thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.